A great good morning from Stanford. My name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty co-director of the Storage X Initiative and a faculty in the Material Science Engineering Department. It is my great pleasure to uh, host uh, the Storage X seminar with my colleague, uh, Yitzhui, the director of the Precourt Institute for Energy. So the topic today is solid state batteries and the mechanical properties of solid state electrolytes. Um, Many of you have uh, participated in a number of our sessions on the topic. Um, we have featured uh, academic experts and also industry experts on the topic. Um, I think we have maybe more than eight speakers on solid state batteries, ranging from oxides, electrolytes, to sulfides, to polymers. And today we're going to continue to expand uh, the type of materials and architecture for solid state batteries. And then also investigate some of the fundamental science um, that governs and limits solid state batteries. And to do that, I'm really delighted um, to have two wonderful speakers joining us today, uh, both veterans, uh, uh, Steve Fisco, uh, who is the founder of Poly Plus Battery Company, uh, one of the most uh, seasoned um, battery companies uh, in the United States, <laughs> and, and also uh, I'm glad to have Eric Herbert, a faculty in Michigan Tech and uh, an expert in mechanics um, and, and has applied it recently uh, to solid state batteries. So let me first ask E um, to come to the stage and introduce Steve and we can get started. Oh, thank you, Will. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you back to Storage X uh, Symposium again. And also I'd like to welcome Steve and Eric uh, as well. Uh, let me introduce Steve. Steve Visco uh, is, a, is a great friend for uh, many years now. Uh, he is the CEO, CTO, and founder of uh, Polyplus. Oh, Steve, you did so much. <laughs> uh, Polyplus has been certainly a well-known uh, battery company uh, over, I think, uh, perhaps about a couple of decades now. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, Steve, uh, I think, uh, started as a, a scientist in uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, having this amazing invention, and then uh, spun out of uh, Polyplus, and uh, he has been leading that. Steve is uh, known as an uh, electrochemistry battery expert. He has so many awards. Let me just mention a few for today's purpose. So he's a fellow of, of Electrochemical Society. Um, he was named by the city of Berkeley as a visionary award for uh, his work in the next generation of batteries. He also won the IBA award for outstanding contribution to the development of lithium air, lithium water batteries. With that introduction, uh, Steve, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Thanks, E. Thanks very much. So should I jump? Yeah, I will share my screen now and we'll jump in. Okay. All right. So um, let's get started. I'm going to walk you through um, not only what's happening at Polycos Battery Company, but um, provide a bit of an overview of some of the choices um, that any of us working in next-gen technology have to make as we decide which solid electrolytes, uh, which types of materials we want to introduce into next-gen batteries and what are the trade-offs and, and some of the decision points um, that are pretty critical here. So, you know, anybody who's following the news on electric vehicles has seen uh, some type of a curve like this over the years, which is adoption of uh, electric car technology you know, as a function of different, uh, it, well, looking across various countries. And so adoption, of course, is ha happening rapidly in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, China is a big player. As, as we all know, um, the lithium-ion batteries that power these EVs uh, came out of Japan and Korea and China. And now uh, we're looking to start manufacturing those batteries that has started in the U.S. and in Europe. So there are big things at play here. But, you know, as has always been the case in the battery field, People want lighter, uh, smaller batteries and cheaper batteries um, with better performance. And so that, that's a tall order. And 
it's not like there haven't been hiccups. Here you see a Chevy Bolt. There was a recall recently for the for the Bolt. And all through San Francisco, you know, we see these types of signs where you're prohibited from parking that car in parking garages because there's concern about fires. And uh, of course, EV fires are not easy to put out because the battery has both the reductant and the oxidant present. And uh, just a month ago, there was a, a, a large hurricane that hit the East Coast, actually hit Florida, the, the West Coast of Florida, um, and buried or flooded a number of EVs, including a number of Teslas. And the headline said that, you know, they were exploding all over Florida. So safety, of course, is critical in this domain. But, um, you know, we want to push forward. So how do we do that? How do we develop the next generation of batteries pushing energy density without compromising safety? And actually, if, if the battery is going into an electric vehicle, you actually can't increase cost either. Um, so that's a very tall order. So how do we do these types of things? You know, the, the response to that question has been solid state. Um, and a number of us, have, you know, of course, are working in this domain. And there's kind of various versions of what we call solid state, semi-solid state, hybrid, um, and then fully solid state. And, you know, we can go through that a bit as well. But, you know, the push to solid state uh, in most cases, not all, but in many cases, involves a transition from carbon uh, to silicon and then ultimately to lithium metal. And here's just a comparison of the gravimetric and volumetric capacity density of lithiated electrodes moving from carbon to silicon to lithium. And the black boxes at the bottom right, you can see that lithium uh, is, is more than four times uh, better volumetrically than carbon and more than 10 times on a weight basis. So there's, and everybody knows it, uh, that there is an incentive, right? To move in this direction, you're going to have lighter, hopefully lighter uh, and you know, safer uh, or as safe battery. So let's let's look at that. So PolyPlus, I'm going to walk you through uh, how this happened. PolyPlus has two technologies that we're developing. One is actually going commercial right now, um, based on polycrystalline solid electrolytes, but the and that is a single use battery. <clears throat> but it it does some of this. Uh, you know, the walk through this technology will show you that by moving to solid electrolytes from liquid to solid electrolytes, we can do things that have never been done in the battery space before. So those those are real numbers you see at the top middle 1900 watt hours per liter, liter and 2000 watt hours per kilogram. So, you know, we can get actually into this domain, which is typically the domain of hydrocarbon fuels, right? Energy densities that look more like gasoline uh, than batteries. But that's that's a primary. And as you move to the right, you can see that we're we're actually developing a different technology there for a, a number of reasons that we'll walk through. But that also will give us a large improvement because again, we're moving to lithium metal. Both of these are lithium metal technologies. All right. So if we're going to move from liquid electrolytes to solid electrolytes, you know, we have some choices. And, and in fact, we kind of had can write down a tick box of, you know, what are the, so what are the requirements here if we're going to make this transition? So, I mean, clearly we need high lithium ion conductivity, um, hopefully at room temperature, not all these uh, solid electrolytes conduct at room temperature, but hopefully at room temperature and below. If you're going to work with lithium, you know, you need to block lithium dendrites. And actually, Eric will talk a little bit about the mechanical properties necessary to do that. Um, and that means you either need thermodynamic or kinetic stability to lithium as well at the interface. Uh, you would prefer low density for your materials. Why? Because these are passive. Uh, the liquid electrolyte doesn't contribute energy to the cell. Right? It's a passive component. So you don't want it to be heavy because that's going to add weight to the cell. So the lower the density of the electrolyte, the better off you are. And you need a roadmap to going thin um, because, you know, if you look at um, modern lithium ion cells, those membranes that separate positive and negative electrodes are pretty damn thin. And they're certainly less than 20. In many cases, they're less than 10 microns. So you cannot be putting a thick membrane in here um, and hope to achieve uh, record-breaking energy densities. And then lastly, but not leastly, uh, if, if these technologies are going to end up in electric vehicles, there has to be at least a path to get to parity with lithium ion. So, so how do we do that? All right, so the, the world of solid electrolytes looks something like this. Your choices are polymers. Um, you know, uh, there, is a, there are solid polymer batteries, lithium metal solid polymer batteries. 
um, in operation in electric vehicles in France. Uh, Bolray has done that. Uh, the other choice for solid electrolyte, of course, is polycrystalline ceramics. And in fact, this is the basis of our lithium seawater technology. And then glasses, um, which is a, in a sense, a newer class of materials. Um, conductive sulfides have been known for a while, but actually continuous sheet sulfides, that is new, right? And so if you look at these three uh, possible choices for uh, polymer, uh, excuse me, for solid electrolytes, you know, what are the upsides and downsides? Well, polymers typically are limited to warm temperatures. There are some polymer electrolytes that have limited conductivity at room temperature, but typically the way you see that done is um, the addition of liquid to the polymer, in which case it is not solid state. And you start to bring in the, the same old problems that lithium metal uh, batteries in the early days prior to lithium ion were exhibiting, which is safety problems. Polycrystalline ceramics um, certainly can, you know, can block dendrites. They're uh, mechanically tough. They are not easy to scale. We'll walk through that a bit for reasons that aren't immediately obvious, but in fact are well known to the ceramics industry. And then glasses, well, everybody probably, you know, in the audience here is walking around with a uh, smartphone that has a thin glass display. So what you see on the right there is um, a technician holding, that is probably 50 microns uh, of oxide glass. You couldn't quite do that with sulfides um, because they need to be protected from the atmosphere. But once you get below about 100 microns, glasses can be processed in a roll-to-roll fashion. So they are scalable and they have been scaled, right? There's an entire industry globally uh, to do this. So they have that advantage. Let's focus on polycrystalline ceramics for a second. Why? Because, um, well, they're, they're certainly interesting, and there's a, there's a large world of conductive ceramic materials available to us uh, with you know, good lithium ion conductivity and sodium ion conductivities in some cases. But um, they also have this particular ceramic, uh, lithium aluminum titanium phosphate, um, uh, known as LATP, is not only highly conductive at room temperature, but it has the unusual property, and this is the only material we found that has this property, of being exceptionally stable to aqueous environments. Um, for a material with such a high lithium ion conductivity and a large population of lithium ions, it's an unexpected property, and it allowed Polyplus to develop this very unusual water-stable lithium metal electrode. You see that on the right. Um, and these are really water stable. We can put that electrode, which is sitting at the lithium potential in water for, in, you know, certainly in excess of a year. We've done these kind of tests uh, with a self discharge rate of zero. Um, here you see a 10 amp hour. So these are very energy dense electrodes, 10 amp hour electrode. Um, but behind that ceramic membrane is almost three millimeters of, of lithium. So in other words, it's very thick, very high capacity. And that is that distinguishes this approach from rechargeables um, in terms of the cost or the amount of solid electrolyte you need. So in this application where we're using these types of ceramics to build very unique high energy density batteries, we don't need much of the electro, solid electrolyte because the capacity density is so high. And that makes a big difference in terms of downstream cost. So this is an affordable approach for a primary battery that has you know, very high capacity. It's going to be different when we start looking at rechargeable batteries, quite different. And it's just a simple mathematical calculation to see the kind of trouble you get in. So um, let's look, though, for a second at this technology. So what you see here, these are actually electrodes we're making now on a line that it, uh, actually a manufacturing line uh, that is installed in Berkeley, which will eventually be moved out of state as we as you start to actually scale this technology. Um, that's a 27 amp hour protected lithium electrode. So it's a lithium electrode stable to water, stable to a you know, variety of, of chemical uh, environments. And on the left, you can see a stack of uh, lithium ion cells, five amp hours. You can just get a sense of scale here in terms of the extremely high capacity density, energy density that's available in these types of electrodes. And we can compare it to, and I'll, I'll show you our numbers, the, the highest energy density battery um, to date, right, which is thionyl chloride, this is a pretty nasty technology. It is toxic, it is explosive, and it's used throughout the ocean. So that's a pretty sensitive environment in which you're putting these uh, toxic systems. And the reason they're, they're being used is they're high energy density and to do long duration missions, 
um, oceanographers, people doing sensing in the ocean um, and robotics, deep ocean, haven't had many choices. I mean, this is where they go. So you'd like to get away from that. So let's compare that um, at, you know, 1100 watt hours per, kilogram, uh, per liter to one of these stacks. So this is an actual battery stack. There are three negatives there um, and four cathodes stacked together. So that's a, that's 81 amp hours of capacity at two volts. It's 160 watt hours. That total stack weighs 80 grams and you can do the math. It's 0.08 kilograms. So that the, the thing that is also interesting here, self-discharge rate, we can't measure it. We've done tests discharging these batteries uh, for close to 15 months and you get full capacity in all cases. So there's no self-discharge because of the solid electrolyte. So that means that a 2.7 inch stack is a kilowatt hour, exceptionally safe. Why is it so safe? Because it's not a battery actually until it's immersed in water. So this thing's being moved around, um, it's exceptionally safe. And here are the metrics though. 2000 watt hours per kilogram, 1900 watt hours per liter. I think this record will probably stand for the next uh, century. It's hard to imagine getting beyond these kind of numbers. Um, and so we've done testing, of course, on um, this third party testing going on now. Um, we did some tests off the coast of Key West in the Sargasso Sea, a um, couple of miles below the surface of the ocean. Um, so this deep ocean testing, um, we actually, the battery itself outperformed our internal tests at Polyplus. You can see there is a float, um, which is tethered to the battery with a data and GPS link to a satellite so we could get that information back. So these batteries are performing exceptionally well. And because of that, uh, we are actually getting ready to uh, start selling the product. So we have a pilot manufacturing line in Berkeley to do this. And uh, we have about four megawatt hours of capacity, but we'll be outstripped that very quickly. So that's that technology. And let's move on to rechargeables. So again, going back to a second for these choices. So obviously we have a lot of experience with polycrystalline ceramics. We have a product based on ceramic membranes. But if you go from single use to rechargeables, there's a rather dramatic shift in the amount of capacity per unit area. What does that mean? It means that the rechargeable battery is gonna require two orders of magnitude more surface area for the solid electrolyte. So that solid electrolyte had better be pretty inexpensive. And you know you can simply compare the price per square meter to what you pay for plastics to go into lithium mine, which is dollars per square meter. Um, and so here, if we were to use this ceramic and a rechargeable, um, we'd be looking at a hundred times the amount of material, the, the surface area for the solid electrolyte, which is not an inconsequential uh, issue, right? So if we look at how you make ceramic membranes typically and this is pretty much the way it's done around the world you start with a ceramic powder make an aqueous suspension um, you tape cast to get a thin uh, tape and then you've got a green tape this part of the 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 fabrication of the ceramic component that's pretty inexpensive right and that's how you make a lithium ion cathode or anode too so this part's trivial the next part is not um, now you have to remove that binder. All of the organics have to be removed. That's typically done at you know four hundred three to four hundred C, and then you have to densify this material to something that has no pinholes and is hopefully twenty microns or thinner. That is not trivial. And quite often, when you try to densify ceramics, uh, they open up pinholes. So if you're making a porous material, okay, that's easy. If you're trying to make a thin, flat, dense, pinhole-free ceramic membrane. That's not trivial, that's quite difficult. And anybody who's done this kind of processing knows that quite often you get things that look like potato chips because you get differential densification when you're sintering because those powders are not mono-sized. And so, and you may have variations in furnace temperature which will also give rise to you know, warpage and deformation. So to get a thin flat membrane is, is non-trivial and typically quite expensive. We can look at that and you can just Google this. Um, not the bottom number, but the top number, just that from core stack. What does it cost to get a 200 micron flat pinhole free piece of alumina? About $1,000 a meter squared. And you want to be at a dollar. So that's actually three orders of magnitude too expensive. Um, and on the bottom, that's a material that uh, was originally targeted for fuel cells. So it's uh, zirconia, if you stabilize zirconia. And this company makes 40 micron membranes. I think they're out of business now, but at the time they were producing this material, we reached out just to get a sense of scaling uh, their material. We asked them 
if they went to uh, EV type scaling, where could they get with the price for this material? And they gave us a price of $5,000 per meter squared. So that's clearly not in the domain of where you could have a solid electrolyte transition to say EV applications, even consumer electronics. And on the right, this is the membrane we use at smaller scale, 20 microns for the membrane that is stable to water. And at 20 microns, that's a very expensive membrane. We don't need to use 20 microns. The primary, we're 10 times that thick. So this is a problem. And then if we go back and look at the world of crystalline and non-crystalline materials for batteries, uh, oxides, sulfides, polymers, you know, if you have to, again, look at density um, and then, you know, and actually cost of scaling. So here are three interesting materials, LATP, uh, garnet, LLZO, which is quite dense, and glasses, which are actually... Uh, closer to the density of polymers, and that's a plus. So this is what we're doing at PolyPlus for the rechargeable technology. Um, we call them glass-protected lithium metal batteries. Um, obviously, we filed a lot of patents around this. So let's look at sulfides because that's the basis of what we're doing. Now, here is actually that what you see there in the video is not a sulfide. That, again, is an oxide glass. But it just gives you a sense of how flexible glasses are when you get down to these dimensions of uh, less than 100 microns thickness. They become, uh, this is a these are roll-to-roll -roll processes, which is what we're doing as well. So the idea then is, uh, is well, the manufacturing process looks quite different. So let's compare and contrast that to what we do for polycrystalline ceramics. Here we take a, the raw material sulfide powders, and in a single step, by heating that up above the melting temperature, we produce a fully dense rod, right? So you get to a fully dense rod, hopefully with no bubbles or inclusions, and that's where we are. And then you start processing that rod. So the next step would be making a preform if you're gonna draw thin glass. And then that preform has to go into some type of a draw tower. That's actually the tower operational in Berkeley. And then from the draw tower, you produce this continuous ribbon of thin glass sheet, which is the basis for building the rechargeable lithium metal battery. So if we look at just, again, this is like a, a Google search, let's look at the pricing of thin glass. So Gorilla Glass, which is in your iPhone, um, just a retail order of 100 pieces, you're already at 40 uh, a meter squared. Willow Glass, um, which is thinner, is roughly uh, $8 a meter squared. And if you look at Chinese suppliers, you can get down to a dollar a meter squared. So this is certainly the domain you want to be um, if you're competing with lithium ion and need a path, right, to, to get to parity. So the actual fabrication then occurs something like this. So what you see on the left, that's a 50 gram ingot of high conductivity sulfide glass. We have another company that's producing that for us. So they ship material to us on a monthly basis. And that can be cut. Here you can see uh, we can cut that into discs that are pressed into discs for electrochemical testing, or we can actually convert this to a preform, and you'll see that as well. Um, so here, here you see we're using a wire saw to cut out a disc. Um, that's a rough cut disc, and then we can actually warm that above the glass transition temperature and just press it simply into a solid electrolyte. Again, pinhole free, fully dense, uh, and then build cells with that. You can also see just the formability of these uh, sulfide glasses in this picture, this photograph, where we actually put a disc of glass between two vitreous carbon plates, softened it, and just drew it up into uh, well, effectively a kind of a tube there. But you obviously cannot do this type of thing with a ceramic material. I mean, you're not going to work, and the melt temperatures would be outrageously high in any case. Um, and they certainly wouldn't draw like this. So, this is a unique attribute of these sulfide glasses that we can basically process them almost as if they were polymers. And, um, and Eric will go into this in more detail, but just a very quick um, comparison of the elastic modulus of the glass that we're working with in red. Um, say versus a polymer electrolyte, you can see, I mean, of course, they're very um, they're very soft materials and lithium dendrites, as we know, penetrate polymers quite easily, particularly at room temperature. Um, but as you go through these uh, glass modulus, so you can see that we're pretty close to the strength of an oxide glass. So these are these are relatively strong materials, certainly strong enough to repel dendrites. Okay. So um, with regards just to simple testing in cells, we take these glass discs, 
Um, we uh, bond lithium metal to the glass disc, and then uh, we can put it into a, a test cell, cycle it against a lithium counter or NMC uh, cathodes. And you can see here that they cycle quite, they, we don't see any evidence of dendritic shorting. They cycle quite well. Um, that's 400 microns, 200 microns glass. And we can also, of course, test at warmer temperatures. That's room temperature here. We're at 45C and we get about 2000 cycles as we cycle these materials. And we can also, of course, uh, we build full cells. You can see here, we're cycling against NMC 622. We see good capacity retention, cycling at roughly C rate uh, commercial capacity. So these are behaving well. And then if we get back to um, just the, the overall kind of flow of how we go from ingot to thin glass, it looks something like this. We start with a bar of glass. We, that is then taken into a precision molding press, which molds the glass into a preform. The preform is then uh, transferred to a draw tower. Again, that's all happening in our lab in Berkeley. And the draw tower can draw thin glass. We put a moisture barrier on the glass. That then is coated with lithium. And then we build cells and pouch cells from, from those components. And so just to show you what the, that tower is doing, um, on the left, you can see an actual preform, right? So that is a sulfide glass bar, basically about a millimeter and a half thick. That is then transferred into the draw tower. And that draw tower does the following. Inside the tower, we have a set of rollers. So the, the preform then is descended into a preheater from a, a furnace, then it descends to the rollers. The rollers then start to roll it thinner. And belief, beneath that process, we have a, a linear actuator, which then pulls, it's a, basically a gripper that pulls the glass even thinner. So as long as we control the rate at which we're pulling and the rate of the, the rollers, we can actually control the thickness of the glass. So again, something that's kind of unique. And this is not unusual for processing thin glass for say displays and things like that. So we're adopting those types of processes, but unique to sulfides, as you can see, our drawer tower is encased um, in a glove box, right? So as we're processing the glass, we have to keep it away from atmosphere. So that's an argon glove box vertical tower. And when we pull the glass, of course, this is quite thin, um, so we image it with a confocal microscope. This is a laser microscope. And you can see here that we can pull glass down as thin as 15 microns. So we're getting down to the dimensions that we need uh, to get into uh, a very high energy density cells. Now, for the time being, we are mechanically cutting the glass. So it's a bit of a rough edge. Um, we are about to transition to laser cutting of these glasses. Um, we can bond that with a six by six centimeter lithium electrode. It's about 100 milliamp hour cell. We're building pouch cells and we're just starting to cycle those pouch cells now and build full cells. These are lithium lithium cells, but we're building full cells now. So we're well on the, uh, on the path uh, to getting to, I would say, more commercial type uh, prototypes. And if we just calculate, and this is a projection, of where we can take the technology as we as we move from graphite or carbon electrodes to lithium metal electrodes, um, that's basically the yellow gap you see there. That's the jump in energy density in that transition. And it's plotted as a function of your choice of cathode. You know, the lithium glass doesn't really care what your cathode is. So, you know, as, as cathodes improve, you'll see the same kind of improvement in, in re with regards to going from graphite to carbon, right? So you can see um, a pretty substantial jump. And then in cross section, um, this artist diagram of the cell looks something like this. You can see, again, we start with a porous metal oxide cathode, thin uh, glass separator, and just a bit of lithium. That's a seed layer for electrodeposition on the first charge. And then we leave some of that lithium as we cycle. Um, and so that should take us for say uh, relative to a conventional lithium ion from 700 watt hours per liter to 1200 and on specific energy from roughly 260 to, to 400. This is still a hybrid cell. In other words, that cathode still has liquid in it. So it's kind of two thirds solid state. We also have another approach, which is happening uh, now within Polyplus, which is a fully solid state, zero liquid cell, which requires then a solid state cathode. So of course the glass is solid state, lithium itself is solid state, but that means transitioning to a, a completely solid cathode. So that work is happening now. We are building basically a three-dimensional uh, cathode 
which uh, will have sulfide uh, solid electrolyte uh, interspersed or within that structure. This is, again, we don't expect to need any pressure to hold this together. This is all bonded. And because we're bonding uh, glass to a rigid uh, composite cathode, we should be able to go even thinner. So we think we can probably move to two to five microns of glass. That'll take us, of course, to higher energy density. Um, the same type of approach has been done in solid oxide fuel cells where you use nickel YSC uh, uh, composites and then lay, uh, lay down YSC on top. And we in the past have done two microns of pinhole free material. So it's, it's certainly doable. And that approach looks something like this. Here on the left, yeah, that's a conventional lithium ion cathode. And on the right, this is what we're doing. So uh, that confocal microscope image is, that's actually LCO. So that there's no carbon, no binder. So there's a three-dimensional structure with porosity. And the first tests we do on the cathodes are, are actually with liquid. And you can see that we get very good cycling. So um, we're moving about 5 milliamp hours per square. Um, so again, at, at reasonable rates. So when we go fully solid state with thinner glass, that should take us into this domain, right? Where you're looking at even greater energy densities. And we expect this to be, of course, the safest of the, of the various iterations of this technology. Um, just to wrap up then, you know, that cell then is, again, not going to have any, any liquids of any kind. And in this case, because we have a supported glass membrane, we can take these up to dimensions where we can hit almost a factor of two on energy density. So that's the technology. Um, you know, we're introducing uh, the both these technologies into a variety of, of applications. So the, the lithium seawater battery, of course, is done. That's going into commercial production now. Um, the glass technology is still in development, but, you know, we expect to introduce it into kind of consumer electronic drone applications because they're premium markets. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, as we scale the technology, um, of course, we'll, we'll take it into larger and larger applications. And I think that is, that's it for me. That ends up my talk. Well, Steve, thank you so much. Uh, very exciting uh, overall development, you know, uh, the polycrystalline and also now uh, glass ceramics uh, electrolyte. Uh, let me ask you a first question. Um, so, and the solid state batteries with lithium, we all, always uh, discuss quite a lot about the interface. Yes, yes. Um, so no matter what's the ceramics or, or polymer, uh, the electrolyte ceramic polymer now, or also the glass, that interface always so important. It, it is. Uh, yeah, I guess for your primary cell, right? Because that it's a uh, it's not rechargeable, so That's you right. always to consume lithium, that's that's different from rechargeable one. That's right. But that's but right. even for primary, uh, do you see this uh, concern of the interface because of the yeah, it's controlling it's moving down? Yeah, yeah. Do no, you absolutely. Pressure and and so on. Yeah. Can you make yeah? Some so yeah. So the interesting thing about the in, in the case of the seawater, I'll, I'll walk through both <clears throat> the seawater technology or the lithium water technology. We do have an in, so LATP is not stable to lithium at all, right? This It's reduced at two volts. So, so LATP and lithium cannot be in direct contact. So we have an interlayer between those two, right? So that interface is controlling, it is critical. Now in that particular technology, um, there's, there's some basically vacuum pressure on that pack, right? So that keeps everything in intimate contact as that electrode discharges. And, and, and th in that particular case, we virtually always get 100% of the lithium that's built into that in, built into that electrode. When you when you transition to the glass, yeah, that's a different that's a different technology. It's a different interface. We so one thing I didn't talk about uh, because it's still pr fairly proprietary is we do have an engineered interface. So we do engineer that interface because it is critical. As you know, anybody who's worked with sulfides knows that they're not thermodynamically stable um, to either lithium or the cathode, which means that you do need some inter interfacial tailoring of, of uh, basically that connection between the negative and positive electrodes to the glass. So that is something that's done post draw tower, right? So we, we do lay down this moisture barrier, which is also uh, transparent to lithium and stable to lithium metal. So yeah, there, there are the parts to that, but you're absolutely right. Those are critical 
critical interfaces uh, with regards to cycling and ensuring that you don't uh, degrade the solid electrolyte itself. Yeah. Uh, similarly, on the cathode side, this is the question from the uh, 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 from audience. Um, so the cathode active materials and the sulfide, oh, uh, sulfide right? So that's the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the same. No, it's absolutely the same. So um, there is a coating on that cathode um, to protect the sulfide. In that sense, not so different than what you know Toyota is doing. So Toyota, if you look at the Toyota approach, they also use sulfides and they use high voltage cathodes as well. They have a coating on their cathode material to protect the sulfide and we do the same. But in their case, um, they're actually just pushing powders together. So since you're pushing powders together, um, you really can't use lithium metal because powders have voids and lithium metal will find those voids very quickly. So that's a lithium ion approach, right? The Toyota approach is lithium ion with sulfides. And on the, again, on the negative side, uh, you're actually okay in that case um, because of the particular sulfide they use. On the cathode side, they do have to protect against oxidation of the sulfides. And you do that with a coating. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, Steve, also um, for the all solid state, right? It's not the hybrid. I mean, um, that's right, solid yes. state. Um, so you for the cathode, you also need to add in this ceramic ion conducting uh, path. That would, uh, you know, what's your experience like? How how much do would you need to add in order to establish in our path with the active? Yeah, so you know, I can tell you. It's, no, it's a great. It's a, we actually when we first started, um, we were not. We didn't think, in fact, that removing... So there's no carbon here at all, right? No binder, no yeah. conductive carbon at all. So we were concerned um, that trying to get this three-dimensional cathode to function would be a problem, right? That you're not going to have ele enough sufficient electronic conductivity through that structure. But in fact, <laughs> from from the get-go, from the first cathodes we made, um, we saw that, in fact, that's it's not, uh, it's not a problem at all, right? We're, but these are you know, these are fused connections. So we, we're not, we don't have discrete powders that are being pushed together. This is literally a three-dimensional interconnected structure. So there's, you know, there are no gaps. It's very different than a powder compact, right? Where you're trying to make contact between either the carbon particles and the cathode particles or the cathode and the cathode. That's a very difficult thing to do and typically takes really high compressive force. So we we did not go down this path. So these these cathodes are just freestanding interconnected cathodes, right? So there is maybe twenty to twenty five to thirty percent porosity there for the solid electrolyte, uh, but in fact the the cathode itself is you know functional by itself without carbon without binder. Interesting. So in terms of processing, is it, you mix a cathode? together with the ceramic particle together, or is you form a cathode for you infiltrate the ceramic Yeah, 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 second, the second approach, the second approach. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense now, yeah. If you yeah, do the second the approach, second. yeah, because your cathode- It'd be difficult to do, yeah, it'd be very, di it, so, you know, there are there are some people who've talked about infiltrating, say, liquid sulfides into such a structure. That's not how we do it. That would be difficult to do because once you soften these glasses, right, you go above the melting point, the viscosity of the glasses is pretty high. You know, it's not like octane or water or things like that who have very, you know, very low viscosity materials. So we use a different approach. So even though we can soften glass and we can move the glass, you, you, you're not going to be able to get it into the fine pore structure that way. So we have a slightly different approach. But, but it, and nevertheless, it is effectively what you said. A, we make a discrete porous three-dimensional cathode, and then we bring the solid electrolyte into that pore structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, makes sense. Hi, Steve. This also overall question about the power density. Let, let's use the current density, you know, to do for discussion, right? Yeah, yeah. My primary cell and also for the uh, rechargeable, uh, yeah. uh, whether it's hybrid or all solid state cell. Could could you discuss a little bit about the current density? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, so if we start first with the polycrystalline approach, right, which is the the water stable electrode. Um, we've we've discharged those structures as high as four milliamps per centimeter squared, and you can get you know virtually full capacity. So when you do that, um, you know let's you probably I would say we probably get ninety six percent 
of the lithium capacity in that structure out. You know, if you go at lower current, current densities, obviously you mm -hmm. get close to 100. So not much of a problem. Be, beyond 4 milliamps per centimeter squared, um, the problem you're going to have is the current, if you look at the current lines, the current distribution starts to get increasingly non-uniform. So you'll start to subtract lithium in a kind of an uneven way from the electrode. So I think above 4 million, it's not that we can't do it, but I would say that's mm -hmm. probably not the domain you want to work. And with the rechargeable uh, system uh, with glass, so I would say we, we've run, we certainly run at C rate, right, where you're discharging three three to four milliamp hours per square across which means you're running at you know three to four milliamps per square um we have not gone much higher than that and on charge you know so this is a whole question of quick charge that i would say that's still an open question um there's you know if fundamentally there's no reason you can't do it but practically and i think eric eric will probably touch on this as well the 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 possibility of, of breaking the glass, right, is going to increase as a function of surface defects, right? So we don't want any kind of sharp uh, kind of defects on the surface where, you know, lithium extrusion could open up a crack. And so, you know, I think as we continue to optimize the glass processing, we should, that we, that'll allow us to go to higher current density. And if, if you look at uh, a product like Willow Glass, right, which Corning makes, so that's a very optimized process for making thin glass. If you look at the surface roughness specification on that particular glass, it's, I think the RA values are something like 0.05 nanometers. So you can, yeah. you can get to extremely smooth surfaces with these types of glass process, but we're not there yet. So we're still optimizing. Yeah. Yeah, that that's good, Steve. Uh, maybe I ask uh, one last question uh, yeah. for the time consideration. Um, for the polycrystalline, you show 10 to minus 3 Siemens per centimeter ionic conductivity. Yes. Uh, and uh, how high is the uh, sulfide glass one? And also, I oh, want to see your thought about is a 10 to minus 3 sufficient right, for, uh, I think, a near uh, most of the applications? Uh, uh, is it absolutely important to go higher or 10 to minus 3 is sufficient? Yeah. Well, you know, as a separator, it's certainly high enough, right? Because if you look at the ASR value at 15 microns, I think it's like two ohm centimeter squared. So that's that's going to be a trivial uh, loss, right, across that membrane. In the composite cathode, yeah, I mean, that may be, you know, still tend to, it'd be nice to be even higher than 10 to minus three. I mean, obviously sulfides have achieved higher conductivities, right? There, there are sulfides yeah. that achieve as high as 10 to the minus two, but those are not glasses. Uh, those are actually crystalline materials themselves. Um, so there's probably still room for improvement within the sulfides in terms of the ionic conductivity itself. But 10 to minus three, I'd say that's kind of a, that's certainly good enough, but I, I think there's room for improvement. Yeah, that's great, Steve. Let me just make last comment and, and then inviting uh, Will and uh, Eric to the stage. Well, Steve, I have been very impressed over the years by, by you, by Polyplast. You have been the person very honest to areas in the status of, of the art, right? So we know uh, a solid electrolyte is not easy, but you have been the person I, I, I really look up to, you know, you, you tell me the uh, state of art information and very honest information. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, we'll pass to you. Thank you, Ian. Steve, let me add my thanks as well. It's always great to see data in presentations, especially from industry. We really appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. All right. Well, now to complement um, Steve's uh, talk on applications and manufacturing of solid state electrolyte and solid state batteries, uh, I'm really delighted to uh, welcome Eric Herbert uh, from Michigan uh, Tech um, to join us. And um, let me briefly introduce Eric. Um, like Steve, he also had a, a, a very extensive career spanning industry, national lab, and academia. And, and I think you will soon also tell us back to the national lab as well. Um, so prior to joining um, Michigan Tech, um, Eric spent a number of years in industry uh, developing metrology and mechanical testing with a focus on a mechanical testing in extreme and uh, operating environments. Um, 
especially for non-ambient uh, mechanical property characterization. Um, and at, uh, at Michigan Tech, uh, he has been investigating fundamental mechanical properties and mechanics, and then recently extending that to explain behaviors in, um, in battery and energy storage applications. Um, so I'm really delighted um, to welcome Eric and uh, for him to give us a bit more fundamental insights to um, the mechanical phenomena that governs the lithium metal uh, solid electrolyte interface uh, that uh, Steve uh, just spoke about. Eric, we're delighted to have you. All right. Well, Will, thank you uh, very much for uh, the introduction and the invitation to, to be here today. It is uh, definitely an honor to uh, uh, well, just to be here, do the presentation uh, for you guys and uh, Steve, so uh, thank you. All right, uh, so as you said, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the critical role of mechanics, and specifically I'm going to focus on the, the mechanical instabilities that develop at this critical interface uh, between uh, the lithium electrode and our solid state electrolyte. Right? So first thing I want to do is just thank all of my collaborators, because uh, without all of their hard work, I certainly wouldn't be here today participating in the seminar. So to all of them, I would like to give a, a resounding thank you. All right, so uh, as I'm sure many of you are all aware, uh, research in the, the field of solid state batteries has really begun to step out of this traditional electrochemistry box, I'll call it, um, and really started to try to think about how these non-uniform lithium ion transfer kinetics are driving these mechanical instabilities that form at the interface between the lithium anode here and our solid electrolyte separator. Okay? So this schematic in the center of the slide, I think, does a pretty good job of just trying to graphically communicate the, the basic problem for us. And so the idea is that uh, these three shapes physically represent some type of morphological defect in the surface of our separator. Right? And so those defects are going to be uh, uh, any sort of deviation from a planar interface, cracks, pores, grain boundary grooves, surface roughness, uh, there's uh, lots of possibilities there. And so these defects are presumably going to be filled with lithium. That's going to come from previous plating and stripping or from an externally applied stack pressure or some combination of all those things, right? And so the upshot for us here is that uh, um, these lithium filled interface defects uh, what happens is, is they create a, a local gradient in the chemical potential, and that gradient uh, forces the incoming lithium ions during charging to preferentially plate out into these defects, right? And so as that happens, the pressure in these defects uh, uh, basically just climbs, right? And so it creates this mechanical instability that uh, is thought to be the, the precursor to the formation and growth of the lithium dendrites or filaments that are originating at this interface and then working their way through the separator and causing the cell to short circuit. Right? So ideally what we're after, what we'd like to have is just uh, planar plating and stripping of course uh, of the anode. Right? If we could just plate one atomic layer at a time then we'd have no gradient in the lattice parameter here and, uh, um, uh, and we'd just have nominally a stress-free interface, right? no instabilities. So that's what we'd like to have. The problem we have to deal with, though, is that uh, these lithium-filled interface defects, right, um, that's uh, going to create this uh, non-uniform uh, plating, and that's going to give us this uh, um, gradient in the lattice parameter here, that gradient in the lattice parameter creates a local gradient in the pressure, right, and the magnitude of that pressure is going to depend on the elastic modulus of the lithium <clears throat> within this localized volume of material. Uh, it's also going to depend on the stress relaxation mechanisms that are available to operate, not only within the lithium, but of course over here on the other side of the interface and the separator as well. Right? So uh, in broad brushstrokes, that's sort of what uh, uh, the basic problem is for us and how we have to think about trying to solve that. Right? So this is uh, one of Jeff Sakamoto's micrographs. Uh, I'm sure many of you have seen this uh, on numerous occasions. So, what I think is particularly fascinating about that, uh, well, not just this image, but just the deformation mechanism, the failure mechanism here, is that even when we go to a single crystal version of LLZO, that doesn't just solve the problem, right? The lithium just finds another defect to exploit. It finds another way to uh, penetrate this ceramic separator 
can cause the, the cell to, to short circuit and fail. So the, sort of the, the million dollar question here from a mechanic standpoint is how and why does it even do this, right? How can it possibly support the pressures that are required to penetrate? In this case, they're coming through the brain boundaries, but you go to a single crystal version and it's just going right through the, the separator, right? So how does it support the pressure that are required? Yeah, so, uh, so that's, that micrograph just illustrates uh, perfectly uh, the problem that we're trying to solve, right? And in order to, to do that, we've got to figure out how to engineer materials and design cells that can obviously prevent the, the formation and growth of these lithium filaments, right? So uh, to that end, right, as I said, the, the ideal goal here is to try to get this uh, stress-free uh, plating and stripping of the anode. But when we can't achieve that, then we're going to have to rely on materials that can intentionally be engineered to alleviate this localized pressure at the interface, right? And in order to do that, we're going to have to um, know something about the, the active stress relief mechanisms that are operating in these materials. And we're going to have to know how those mechanisms change in going from one end of the material to the next, right? Um, and then, of course, there's the, the separator side of the puzzle, right? That's obviously going to play a major role in stress relief as well. And there's a bit of a kind of a whopper of a challenge in there because the stress relief mechanisms in the separators are obviously going to be really different as we go from ceramic to glasses to polymers and composite materials, right? So there's a lot of moving parts in there, right? And if that wasn't complicated enough, then we also need to know how the efficiency of those stress relief mechanisms is going to change with operating conditions like temperature, current density, and cycling of the anode. Right? So bottom line is uh, you know, we've learned a whole lot about that, I'd say, in the past three to five years, but there's still a lot of knowledge gaps to try to fill in here. Right? So I think one of the most important things I want to uh, try to get across and bring to your attention is the idea of relevant length scales, right? And so clearly the, the mechanical properties of uh, bulk lithium metal, right, they're really important to us, right? But the, the mechanism of action that limits the pressure in this case to one megapascal, right? That mechanism may be completely inoperable at the length scales of these local inhomogeneities, right? These stress concentrations that are forming at the, this, this critical interface. And without those mechanisms, right, it's not clear what happens, or at least uh, it'll be more clear after this presentation, what happens when that mechanism is not available to, to keep the pressure um, at or below this one megapascal threshold. Right? So uh, that's really the, uh, I think, the, one of the fundamental messages here is that it's not just about the bulk properties of lithium, it's about what's happening at these small length scales relevant to the, uh, the defects that uh, are um, at the interface there between the separator and the, the, the lithium anode, right? Okay, so uh, I think just to try to drive home that basic concept and give you, you know, a feel for um, what some of these mechanisms are and how we expect them to be operating, um, I just want to walk you through this sort of simple graphical description of uh, this whole idea of this length scale effect, right? And so we're going to do that, and try to do that in the context of uh, these mechanisms that are controlling the pressure within these lithium filled interface defects, all right? So this uh, schematic over here on the left is basically just trying to communicate to us what's happening with the, the pressure, how much pressure can be sustained within these defects Right, but uh, as a function of length scale, right? And so this yellowish box down here in the corner, uh, physically, that's just a, a length scale limit that once we get above that, right, self-limiting behavior of lithium is capped by its flow stress, right? So in that box, it's all about, uh, in, in bigger length scales, it's all about the, the bulk properties of lithium, okay? So now if we go to, to smaller length scales, then uh, the pressure initially is going to climb, right? It's going to move up in this direction as we go to smaller length scales. And that's happening just because at smaller length scales, it becomes statistically harder to find the mobile dislocations, the active dislocation multiplication sources or the grain boundaries, all the defects that we nominally need in order to you know, have any sort of form of efficient stress relief by plastic deformation, right? And so, Keep in mind for lithium, even just at room temperature, it's continuously annealing, right? So the dislocation density is, uh, is always decreasing with time. So 
even at room temperature, right? It's just constantly in this mode of, uh, of recovery. So um, at some point here, right, as you continue to go down in length scale, the idea is that there's going to be this reversal that takes place in the pressure, right? And this reversal happens because the, the dominant mechanism of action that is controlling the, the stress relief or the pressure within that defect, here it's taken to be volume diffusion, right? And so that mechanism becomes more and more efficient as the diffusion length gets shorter and shorter, right? So <clears throat> the net effect is that uh, uh, there's sort of this critical defect dimension, right, that is just right for maximizing the stress concentration, making that stress uh, as, as big as possible. And, uh, and that's the stresses, or those are the stresses that are the most likely to cause the, the electrolyte to fail by fracture. And so we refer to this critical length scale here as just the, the defect danger zone, right? So the uh, bottom line is larger defects like this one, they're going to pose less of a threat because the, there's, the volume's big enough that there's a high probability of finding the dislocations that are required to enable this stress relief by plastic flow, right? They're going to keep the pressure at a megapascal or less, roughly, right? And then these smaller defects, they're not going to cause too many problems either because the uh, stress-directed diffusion is going to be an efficient stress relief mechanism, right? But then it's the defect volumes that are in between these two, right? These are the defect volumes that are potentially going to cause a problem. They're too big for diffusion to be an efficient stress relief mechanism, but they're too large to have a high probability of finding the defects that you need to enable plastic flow, keep the pressure below a megapascal, right? So in very broad brushstrokes, that's the basic concept of this length scale dependent strength and then how that length scale dependence relates to the development of stress intensification at this buried interface here between our lithium anode and our solid electrolyte separator, right? Um, and I think just for the interest of time, we're gonna skip over those two particular uh, issues, but uh, yeah, so this next slide, uh, I'm not going to go into any of the details here, um, but uh, basically it's just explaining that this concept of uh, smaller is stronger is not a new phenomenon. Right? It's actually been around for a really long time. Uh, this is some work that was done by a fellow named Brenner in 1956. Um, and it's just uh, illustrating the same concept that uh, we're using to, to describe what's going on with the, the lithium. So I'm not going to get into the details of this. Uh, happy to chat about it uh, afterwards if you have any questions. But this is not an idea that, uh, uh, you know, that we came up with by any stretch. It's been around for quite a while, right? So uh, in order to really try to examine these length scale dependent uh, strength issues in lithium, we turn to uh, uh, an experimental technique called nano indentation, right? And so the basic idea is that we're going to drive this probe of some known geometry into the surface of the lithium. And then we're going to simultaneously record the, the applied load and then this measured displacement, right? And so it's data like these that we're going to use to extract the mechanical properties of interest. And uh, at least initially, the properties we're after are the, the hardness and then the, the elastic modulus, right? And so over here on the left is kind of a big long laundry list of um, um, why we've opted to go this route. I'm not going to take the time to uh, uh, discuss any of those now, but again, if uh, you have any questions about that, I'd be happy to explain why I think uh, the nano indentation is really well suited to uh, trying to better understand this problem. Right. Um, so this is uh, just a schematic illustration of what uh, our electromagnetic actuator looks like. Um, and again, we really don't need to get into uh, any of the details of that, but if you're interested in uh, you know, learning more about that, I'm happy to, to tell you all about it and why some of the, the design features for that are particularly relevant to the experiments that we're trying to do with the lithium, right? Um, so here, yeah, so, um, again, I'm not going to go into these details either, but uh, I would be very remiss to not point out that uh, these experiments are really pretty challenging. So. Um, as my old advisor used to, to joke around and say, uh, um, there are just uh, a lot of snakes in the woodpile here. So uh, it's, it's really difficult to uh, do all the hoop jumping and uh, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's to make sure that you're really measuring what you think you're measuring in these experiments. So uh, um, a lot of things to, to discuss there. Um, right. Um, so anyway, uh, moving on from that. 
This is uh, uh, just a picture of our nano indentation system and its uh, dedicated glove box. So you can see here's the actuator here, there's the test specimen. Um, and then this, of course, is the, the microscope that we use for targeting and any sort of uh, uh, post-test analysis of the, the residual hardness impressions here. And so the, the lion's share of the work is just um, right there, right there inside the glove box. All right, um, so uh, I want to get started just by taking a look at the measured elastic modulus, right? And so we're interested in the, the modulus that we measure in the lithium films for these three basic reasons. All right, so first, the magnitude plays a really key role in telling us what the pressure is going to be within these lithium-filled uh, interface defects. And the tube gives us some insight into any contaminants that uh, are forming on the surface of our lithium. And number three, it allows us to indirectly verify the, the area calculations that we're going to use to determine the hardness, and that's telling us what the pressure is, right? So uh, this uh, uh, plot in the, the middle here, um, this is showing us the, the average elastic modulus for the five micron thick vapor deposited lithium film on a glass substrate. And so these open squares up here represent the nominally measured modulus, which is uh, very strongly influenced by the glass substrate, you can see. And then these half-filled symbols here um, uh, those represent the actual modulus of the lithium film once the substrate effect has been removed using this thin film model developed by Jennifer Hay and Brian Crawford, right? And so, as you can see, once we get the substrate effect out, then the modulus data are predominantly depth independent and they're in good agreement with the, the literature values, right? And so, uh, this is also telling us that uh, the film is uh, not significantly contaminated, right? Um, so moving on from that, um, just a few more experiments uh, to really take a look at the modulus and see what we can learn about the, um, any texture in the film thickness. So this plot is showing us the, the cumulative probability for the elastic modulus as measured from uh, three different arrays and two different films. So one's five microns thick, the other one's 19, sorry, 18 microns, right? And so the, the range in modulus that we see here is, uh, is really consistent with the elastic anisotropy that we expect. And the difference in the mean value is telling us that there is a slight texture effect with uh, the film thickness there. So, all right. So the uh, next thing I want to do is uh, take a look at the hardness. All right. But uh, before we look at the hardness of the lithium, I want to give you an idea of what to nominally expect. All right, so mathematically over here, hardness is just uh, the applied load normalized by this projected contact area, right? So when we define it that way, hardness is just the applied, or sorry, hardness is just physically, um, it, it's representing the mean pressure that the surface is capable of supporting, right? And so when you think about that in the context of a bulk, homogeneous crystalline metal at a low homologous temperature, um, you know, what we uh, uh, nominally expect is that plasticity is going to be controlled by dislocation glide, and that in that case, the, the hardness that we measure out here at deep depths is nominally going to be three times the flow stress, or in this case, three times the, the yield stress. And so for our lithium, our expectation would be that, you know, out here at deep depths, the hardness is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about one and a half to three megapascals, right? And so uh, as you work your way to smaller depths, there's kind of an interesting thing that happens when you get to uh, a depth of about one to three microns. And below that range, the, the hardness starts trending up. And uh, the reason for that, even in a, in a bulk homogeneous material, um, it's something called the indentation size effect, all right? Um, and so I'm not gonna talk about that in any details, but uh, um, this is, this red line physically represents what we would nominally expect to see for this bulk homogeneous crystalline material, right? Um, and our expected hardness is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of this one to three megapascals, right? Now, clearly for the lithium, um, we're not uh, in the realm of bulk, right? Because we're looking at relatively small volumes. It is certainly homogeneous, it's crystalline, um, but we are not at uh, a low homologous temperature either, right? And so all of that is going to translate into giving us a very, very different data set because our hardness as a function of depth looks nothing like this red curve. Right? And so uh, here it is. In, uh, in this data set, right, we're looking at the average of uh, um, 100 uh, measurements uh, uh, in the hardness right, performed on a single lithium film. 
And so uh, over here on the right, we've got uh, several representative load displacement curves. And these curves help us try to rationalize and figure out what's going on over here in the, the hardness data, right? So the first thing I would point out is that this depth dependence in the hardness doesn't look anything like what we nominally expect, right? Um, there's a ton of scatter in the data, but uh, the, the average values are remarkably repeatable. And beyond that, this, uh, this pressure that we're measuring, it's, it's surprisingly is climbing here, right? It's not, not going up, it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, constant, it's, 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 in fact, it's climbing, right? So it's climbing to this peak value of nearly 40 uh, megapascals. Um, and that's at about 400 nanometers, right? And then after that, it abruptly falls off, you know, just uh, headed down this cliff, basically. So when you look at what's happening over here in the low displacement curves, this peak corresponds to these strain bursts that show up uh, over here in the low displacement data, all right? And so it's a little bit easier to, to see that if we take a look at these individual curves now. And so here we've got... Uh, um, uh, six out of the hundred curves that went into creating this set of average data here, all right? And so as you can see, the, the average peak here corresponds to these strain bursts, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and yeah, so that's it. So as I mentioned, the, the, the yield strength of the bulk lithium is uh, about three, or sorry, about one MPA. So the expected value is somewhere around three, and clearly we're way above that. And even if you bring in the, the indentation size effect, you know, uh, to get from one to 40, we're way beyond what we would expect to see for the indentation size effect as well. What I would also point out, though, is that we're not anywhere near the, the theoretical shear strength of lithium either. Um, at 40 MPA, we're somewhere in the neighborhood of about 14% uh, of that value, right? Assuming it's somewhere in the range of G over 2 pi to G over 30, right? So, um, uh, so the important takeaway here, right, is that before this transition occurs, right, uh, before you, you get to this peak, um, these pressures are climbing in a way that uh, uh, is pretty difficult to rationalize. And if there's dislocation motion over here, it uh, is clearly extremely inefficient, right? And then once this avalanche event occurs, uh, the data here are characteristic of stick-slip behavior and in general are sort of consistent with what we expect out of uh, the indentation size effect, right? So um, in, you know, with all of that uh, information there about what's happening experimentally, the way that we rationalize that is that uh, prior to this peak, um, we think that all of this deformation here is being accommodated by stress-directed diffusion, right? And that's what gives rise to this unexpected uh, depth dependence. So um, as you drive the indenter in, the diffusion length is getting longer and longer. And uh, as a result, that mechanism becomes less and less efficient. So the pressure climbs, right? And then eventually, the, the stressed volume is big enough so that uh, uh, the, the threshold in stress and threshold in volume, those two things are large enough, right? Clearly, it's stochastic, right? It varies from one location to the next. But uh, that volume becomes large enough to encompass uh, uh, either a mobile dislocation or, in this case, right, with this avalanche, it's got to be some type of dislocation multiplication source. And that's what allows this pressure to fall off, and then uh, we get into uh, more dislocation-mediated flow, all right? But that's our basic picture of what we think is, uh, is happening with the, the lithium. And so as you go to uh, um, uh, higher strain rates, right, Basically, what we see is that uh, low strain rates, uh, we have no difficulty here uh, rationalizing that with uh, this volume diffusion mechanism, that's this Nabarro herring. Um, it doesn't work nearly as well as we go to, to higher strain rates, but at least it has the, the same sort of trend. And then at the highest strain rate still, then the hardness does trend down, right? And it begins to take on the shape of that indentation size effect, but uh, um, it is not consistent with any of that behavior in the way that we nominally expect it. So when we look at other diffusion mechanisms, we can uh, rationalize this pretty well with something called Harper-Dorn. And this is just a, a non-conservative climb process. Still requires the dislocations, but a very different mechanism from Navarro herring And clearly, it's just a much less efficient mechanism, right? So at any rate, <clears throat> this is what we see in, uh, in the context of uh, what sort of pressures can be supported by lithium at relatively small length scales. And when you look at these numbers, right, 
these are these are huge. They're orders of magnitude larger than what we would nominally expect. Okay, and so uh, that's going to create some problems for us when we try to think about how to mitigate these stresses that are developing at uh, this interface. And I'm looking at the clock, and time is uh, running away. So let me uh, just skip through uh, some of these. Sorry. Um, what I want to really try to get to, and it was just to, uh, sort of at the tail end, you know, clearly in order to alleviate that pressure, we're going to have to figure out how to engineer some uh, microscale ductility into the lithium. There's a lot of ways to potentially do that, but we're also going to have to figure out how to do that into the, the solid electrolyte separators, right? And so there's lots of ways to think about um, enabling some sort of microscale ductility through densification and uh, uh, some shear flow, maybe. Uh, there's lots of interesting tricks to, to potentially do that. And when we look at um, um, some of these stress relaxation mechanisms and materials like Lipon, it's really interesting what we see and to think about how you might alter the structure property relationships and other materials to try to work towards these types of goals so that you can have stress relief from the separator. Um, so this is the, the stress exponent for creep that we measure in, uh, in Lipon. So that's telling us something unique about the stress relaxation mechanisms in that material. And in fact, when we look at uh, data from uh, these cyclic experiments in uh, Lipon, again, you see this very interesting energy dissipation capability in, in Lipon. And so the next step is to think about how we would do a, a sort of a more targeted approach to measure the mechanical properties and subject it to the sinusoidal loading. So we can do that for a 600 second block um, and then look at these data in terms of uh, load and displacement. This is not on LIPON, but this is where we're headed next. And we're looking for this energy dissipation capability so that we can figure out how to, you know, relate that back to structure property relationships and then use that to inform decisions about uh, processing so that we can try to create interfaces that are capable of mitigating these unwanted stresses that build up right so uh, i guess uh, just to, in closing here there are you know, a lot of takeaways from uh, from all of this but i think the the most important message to get in relation to generating future models to try to address these issues is uh, that you, you really have to think about the, the mechanical properties of these materials at relevant length scales. And those relevant length scales are going to be the length scales of defects at the interface, right? The, the bulk properties are clearly important, but those properties alone are not going to allow you to solve these, this problem, right? So we need length scale effects. Um, and we need to think about how those length scale effects uh, are going to be impacted by uh, a number of operating conditions. So temperature, current density, cycling, right? Um, and so there's a lot of ways to potentially do that uh, by controlling these uh, structure property processing relationships. Uh, and it's on the, the anode side and the separator side. So uh, there's just a lot of really interesting space to explore there to try to engineer those stress relief uh, mechanisms and create mechanically stable interfaces. So uh, with that, I will end and uh, be happy to take any questions you have. Eric, thank you so much uh, for the presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, let me start just uh, with, with one question on interfaces. Um, so Eric, you, you highlighted the importance of uh, length scale dependence in the mechanical property of lithium metal. Um, and you know your depth dependence really illustrates that as well. So I, I'm curious if you can comment a little bit on the interaction between the mechanical property and the chemistry. So whether it's intentional or unintentional, there's always uh, considerable impurity segregations um, at the interface of, uh, at the surface of lithium metal, for example. And these can really be quite deep, um, you know, certainly tens of nanometers, in some cases hundreds, depending on how the impurity was introduced, whether it was pre-existing um, and because the mobility of the impurities is also very high in lithium. So I'm curious if, if you're able to draw some connection between the mechanical property and the chemistry at the interface. So my only insight into that is uh, uh, by looking at lithium surfaces that have been intentionally, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, I'll say contaminated, right? Um, and yes, we see a, a huge change in the behavior. And the, the problem is that uh, 
um, at least the, the contamination layers that we've looked at so far, um, they effectively inhibit this surface diffusion capability. Mm. And so it's, you're robbing that stress relief mechanism of the lithium. And so, yeah, the, the pressures that uh, we observe, you know, at small depths um, get, again, really high. And even when we're at slow strain rates or low strain rates, um, the difference between, uh, um, you know, the best lithium surfaces we can uh, produce and, and look at, uh, it's very different than when the surface is intentionally contaminated, right? And, you know, when we look at just the effect of operating conditions, uh, I don't, it's, you know, um, yeah, well, never mind. I guess we'll leave that alone. So uh, the... Does that answer your question? <laughs> Absolutely, Eric. So, so uh, let me just make sure I understand. So your your current thinking is that impurities would um, decrease the mechanical strength of lithium, or will be detrimental um, to to lithium metal in terms of a reversible plating and stripping. So, from a mechanic standpoint, and I, I guess I should be really careful about that. You worded that really well. So, uh, um, no, I. It's conceivable that adding um, alloying elements, right, um, you know, maybe something like aluminum, right, uh, obviously you're going to pay a, a, an energy density penalty, but it could be that there are, you know, ways to alloy the lithium that promote this uh, self-diffusion capability and make that mechanism more efficient, and therefore it becomes, uh, you know, much more capable of creating a mechanically stable interface, right? So that possibility is definitely there. And we're actually looking at that right now. So what I was speaking to was uh, uh, the existence of a contamination layer. So it's you know, lithium that's been freshly deposited and then um, immediately introducing um, a uh, um, CO2 atmosphere to the, the deposition chamber, the, the, the evaporation chamber, and then depositing this contamination layer on the surface, right? Um, the other place that we see something like that is when we look at lithium from commercial suppliers. Um, you know, the lithium is, you know, has some contamination layer on the surface, and that layer has a profound impact on what we see in the, the mechanics um, at, uh, you know, near the free surface. And uh, you'd obviously expect that to be there, but uh, the effect was really profound. So I guess the, the moral of the story there was, uh, okay, we really need to try to figure out how to either clean those surfaces off or just to um, deposit the lithium in a way that uh, those contaminants uh, just aren't there or they're minimized, right? Yeah, we should definitely talk about this in the panel discussion with Steve on the challenges of uh, processing lithium and yeah. essentially chews up everything. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> it's very good at scavenging everything uh, on the surface. Um, yeah. Right. Maybe let me just ask one more question, and then uh, we can bring bring Steve into the panel discussion. Um, your, your work um, that you presented mostly focuses on the property of these uh, uh, um, nano indentation in, in thin and thick films of lithium. Um, have you also explored um, um, size effects in lithium? I, I'm, I'm not sure how easy this is to do. Um, but it's being increasingly recognized that after repeated um, stripping and plating cycle, that de-wetting of lithium from solid electrolyte can lead to smaller and smaller structures uh, at the interface, creating porosity. And I imagine that would also have a really substantial impact on mechanical properties as well. Yeah, certainly could. And, uh, you know, we have high hopes of uh, being able to do that. We're uh, uh, trying to figure out uh, just how to do the, the integration to be able to cycle the, mm. the lithium uh, in our glove box and then do experiments on the, the cycled surfaces. Um, um, uh, Nancy Dudney came up with a, a clever way to create a, a cell that would uh, allow us to do that and still have uh, an exposed lithium surface, you know, even though it had been cycled um, uh, many times. Um, so we're trying to figure out how to do that right now. Um, but yes, that's, you're exactly right. And that's why we're doing it, because we expect there to be a difference. And that would be a really incredibly informative experiment, especially if you start with no lithium and just uh, plate it. It should sure. be the purest lithium you can get. Um, that's right. Like a, a lithium free cell, basically, to begin with. Right, exactly. That would be really Got exciting. It. Wonderful, Eric. So I see Steve has already joined us. So uh, if I can ask uh, Justin to spotlight the three of us, perfect. And uh, I think uh, he unfortunately had to uh, uh, to attend to another matter. 
So let me begin just um, continuing along the same line of discussion. You know, when it comes to manufacturing, right, of uh, mm -hmm. um, solid state batteries, um, you know, impurities, defects, all, all very critical, as both of you highlighted repeatedly. Yeah. Can you give us some sense the impurity and the defect requirements of solid electrolyte in comparison to other um, technical materials. So, Steve, you mentioned you know glasses are obviously scaled uh, and, yep. and manufactured very inexpensively, but I think we don't have a good idea. You know, is that good enough in terms of impurity and defects, or is the requirement for solid state battery pushing uh, even those glasses even to a higher territory? So, basic, I'm trying to understand a little bit of how the requirements of a solid state battery may impact the cost of processing moving forward and, and whether or not, what is a good comparison is, is another material that sort of have similar requirements in terms of defects and impurities. Yeah, um, you're right. It's pretty early, you know, in, in that, in that process of looking at impurities and performance and, and how this is going to map out in terms of cost. I can tell you that um, in a very simple sense, if we're melting uh, raw materials to form glass, and then the idea is that you're going to pull, th say, thin ribbons of glass from that, you can imagine that if you have 50 micron inclusions, that then becomes an impossibility. You're not going to be able to pull 20 micron glass if there are particles um, embedded. And, and absolutely, as when we started this work, that, that was certainly a problem, right? Um, you know, many of these, the, so the sulfide glasses typically when you, when you make them, are being they're done in in quartz ampules of some type right because they have to be isolated from oxygen and moisture so um that puts a certain requirement on the actually on the on the quartz itself because these can be corrosive materials so quite often then um you're coating the quartz with a protective layer and if that protective layer um spalls and gets into the melt yeah then then that is it. so all of those things are issues, you know, absolutely. Uh, I think in terms of the raw materials for glass making themselves, lithium sulfide tends to be very high purity. Um, there are a number of producers now. Uh, in, in fact, Toyota's entrance into this domain, right, working with sulfides, uh, has in some ways pushed suppliers to, to look at these, these kind of impurities and scaling a little bit more carefully. That's helped us as well. Um, so we don't see any problem right now with, I would say, at least the Li2S source. That's that, And it's a big part of the glass, by the way. Many of these glasses are 70 mole percent Li2S, right? So it's it's very much a, a big part of the of the glass melting and glass processing. And then on the other side, so that, that's the network modifier. Then the network formers are typically chosen from P2S5, B2S3 and SIS2, right? Those are the key constituents. And um, yeah, absolutely, you have to be very careful um, how that how that is kind of, uh, you know, one, where you're getting your raw materials from, uh, two, how you're processing them. Absolutely, it's, it's for sure a part of this. And I, I don't know if I mentioned it, but if you look at, I think E uh, had a question about, you know, surface um, topography. If, if you look at silica glasses, that's a very mature industry obviously, right? And you were to look at uh, something like willow glass, which is a corning product, and then look at the um, the spec for surface roughness on that drawn glass. It's it's pretty remarkable. I think the RA value is, um, is specced at 0.05 nanometers, right? So these are- 0.05? 0.05 nanometers, yeah. Nanometers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's basically atomically smooth. And actually, if you look at uh, the bend strength of a lot of these, you know, uh, thin glass display materials, mm -hmm. if they're if they're laser cut, you know, so that you have a near perfect edge, because that's typically the way these glasses break. If you know, if you have a mechanically cut edge, you're going to have defects at the edge. They'll break because of defects at the edge of the glass, not really from the surface of the glass. But if you look at laser cut um, thin glass the bend strength approaches the bond strength of the silicon oxygen bond. So you can get really, really strong materials if you're careful about, yeah, surface defects and, and edge control. And, uh, you know, this is one of the reasons we're, another one of the reasons we're pushing down this path, right, is that you can get, you can um, certainly theoretically get to very, very smooth, almost defect-free mm -hmm. surfaces, right, in the, in the long term. We're not there yet. 
Um, and in, in fact, if you were to look at, there are a variety of ways to make thin glass sheet. I mean, you can imagine, uh, obviously there's a float process that's not gonna work for sulfides. Um, Corning has something known as the fusion process where you have two, effectively two molten streams of glass coming over a, a platinum structure. And so that flowing glass, uh, the outside edge of the glass has never touched the surface. And the inside edge has touched the platinum surface, but then you know they basically blow those two surfaces together and fuse them. So you have a single glass sheet coming down. And in that case, neither the top or bottom surface of the glass has ever touched anything. And that's how you get to these remarkably smooth materials, right? So there, there are different ways to, and that may in fact work for that kind of a fusion process might work long-term, but the scale of doing fusion glasses is, is huge, right? So, you know, you, we, we don't have the, you know, multiple uh, truckloads of, of sulfide glass right now that would be required to do that. But I think in the long-term, you, you, we should be able to get to, pre, you know, I would say ideally defect-free glass. Mm -hmm. See, this is really exciting. So, so I think what, what you're describing here is there are materials today massively produced that has the right defect density for solid state batteries. That's like, right. Right. If that's it's right. nanometer, you know, type of defect and roughness, that, that, that's we're all set. Right. So, yes. so am I correct to interpret that? Then you feel manufacturing these completely defect free glass should not be a problem. Yeah, right. I mean, well, it'll be it, it'll be technically challenging. Like it, it, you know, if you go back to the early days of making thin glass display glass, right? I mean, there's you know, there's certainly a lot of very clever innovation done there. But that, that's right. There's an existence proof, right, mm -hmm. for virtually defect-free materials. And you know, you just you know, it's gonna be very difficult to replicate that with any kind of a crystalline material. I mean, I don't I don't know how you do it. Um, but with glasses, you know. You, you have that, you definitely have that, that path, right? Where you can you get to these defect free materials. And, and if you look at the, for instance, a product like Willow Glass, right? Which is sold commercially, it's relatively inexpensive, right? So you're getting to these near perfect materials. I mean, that's driven obviously by the large uh, LCD flat panel TV, uh, you know, markets. They're, they're very large, very profitable, but those glass sheets are produced at low cost and in, in high, high volume. And this certainly was one of the drivers for us to move in this direction. Mm -hmm. Well, this is very exciting. Um, thank you, Stephen. Eric, I was wondering if you can also comment a bit on um, on this aspect of defect, um, sort of the minimum defect or the maximum allowed defect density um, uh, at the electrolyte uh, interface that will be needed. Sure. So I think everything Steve just said is, uh, um, you know, that's wonderful, right? That's what we should definitely be shooting for to the extent that we can achieve that definitely headed in the right direction. Um, the only thing that uh, um, is a bit of a red flag that still exists for me in that, you know, even if Elvis showed up and just made a perfectly flat interface for us, right? It's atomically flat. One of the things that Jeff uh, Sakamoto showed is that uh, these failure events can occur from just uh, you know, localized regions at the interface where there's some perturbation. And I guess it's the, I'm not a battery person here. So um, I think it was an over potential or the, uh, the exchange current density, right? Some minor perturbation in there that uh, creates this preferential diffusion of lithium into sort of a hot spot, right? So yeah. it's planar interface, but still that perturbation. And that scenario creates the, the same problem that we're trying to solve with a physical defect, right? So, you know, I think in the end, I would, I'd go after it on two fronts if I could. I'd do exactly what Steve just outlined. I'd be gunning for that. And then I would also follow this path of trying to figure out how to engineer my material to alleviate stress, right? I would mm -hmm. engineer it to have these stress relaxation right. mechanisms that uh, um, can cope with the, the pressures that develop these, you know, stress concentrations, mechanical instabilities, whatever you want to call them, right. um, wherever they show up, whether it's at a defect or a planar interface that has this, uh, um, you know, uh, variation in the uh, electrochemical properties. So that's my immediate thought there. And then the, the second question or sorry second point i wanted to make to your question was uh, you know we did exactly what you were talking about we went back and said okay let's try to create a deformation mechanism map that says 
here's the defect dimension, you know, what is the that defect danger zone I was talking about, right? What are the physical dimensions for that? And, uh, you know, do you get, can we have some shot of just avoiding that, right? Don't go there. And the, the problem with that is that that defect danger zone depends uh, pretty heavily on a lot of operating conditions. So it's the current density, it's the modulus of the lithium that's in the defect, it's the physical geometry of the, the defect, right? And so now that critical, you know, dimension, that defect danger zone, it's very much a moving target. So it's not like you can just say, hey, here's the, you know, the dimension we need to avoid. Well, okay, it's that dimension for these conditions, but we're going to change the conditions and now it's a different one. So that doesn't seem like a very attractive uh, approach to take. So, you know, what Steve's talking about, just, uh, okay, let's, you know, try to make that surface as smooth as we possibly can. That's going to be the best way to mitigate, uh, you know, the instabilities that uh, would form in other defects, right? That's, that's right. how you solve that problem. But uh, right. so anyway, I, that's uh, my two cents worth on uh, on that. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, the other part, of it, and it, I think it, it it points to some of the things you've been talking about, Eric, is is also uh, uniform current density as, as much as that is possible. I mean, that's good for all battery systems, right? You, you kind of prefer to have uniform plating. I mean, that'll get worse as you go to higher and higher charging rates, right? So um, there may be a limit, right, on on how, you know, this kind of quick charge, which which is obviously desirable for things like EVs. That that might be pushing a push to you know a, a goal too far. We'll have to see, but um, we know you know with virtually all the electrochemical systems we work with, as you push current density up, the chance to have a more non-uniform current distribution increases, right? Because everything has to be near perfect uh, otherwise to achieve that. I mean, on the other side too, you look at now these are not particularly high current densities, but you look at these lipon cells, which was our original inspiration. You know, it's rather remarkable uh, that you you know there have been reports of ten to fifteen thousand uh, you know cycles at one hundred percent depth of discharge. So there is something pretty unique about these lithium glass interfaces um, that can allow you to do that. And you know it's probably a combination of these things that we're talking about. But but clearly it's it's possible. The question is like you know how difficult is it to get there, and how much, and how much? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, Steve, this is a great segue to my my next question. Um, you know, which is sort of the converse of what we've been talking about. So, so Steve, you and Eric have been talking about um, mechanical damages or mechanical uh, indentations on solid electrolytes. Yeah. Um, but I think a converse could also be that uh, you have global stresses being applied to the battery. So, Steve, you mentioned edge effects. Yeah. I can also imagine. Um, you know, slight bending in the cell when you put it into a, a, a multi-layer stack or a battery pack. Right. And, you know, we're putting these things really close um, together. So uh, pressure non-uniformity will exist um, no matter what. Um, you know, you may have even inclusions and um, particles um, uh, that you put into between the layers and that creates local stresses as well. Yeah. So, it would be great if we can also talk about a little bit of the manufacturing challenges again, how sensitive everything is to pressure uniformity. Is there going to be a challenge or how, what is the requirement in terms of how mechanically uniform the system has to be uh, in terms of pressure? Um, you know, we're dealing with very, very small cells here, but when we go to right. the large cells, 20 layer cells, man, I can only imagine what the non-uniformity must be. Yeah, I don't know. Do you have a, a view on that, Eric? Or do you want me to jump in? Um, I guess I... You know, what comes to mind for me is uh, in that context is you're right. It, it does get kind of crazy because um, just, you know, pick a simple one like stack pressure, right? Stack pressure does all sorts of things to uh, to create these interface shear stresses that are opposing the, the flow of, of lithium, right? So you get this friction hill that develops and the friction hill depends on what the, the friction conditions are. Nobody really knows what to, you know values to plug in for that, um, and you get uh, you know some really complex states of stress there that uh, uh, complicate this whole picture. So it's not immediately clear how all that uh, fits together, right? It's uh, it's a pretty challenging problem, and <laughs> the 
you know, one of the most challenging aspects of it is uh, those frictional stresses that develop at the interface. They change as you cycle the, the cell, right? So as you get to, uh, thinner and thinner anodes, right, um, cycling the cell and the, the radial dimensions nominally the same, as that ratio changes, then the friction hill is totally changing as well. And so uh, it's just a whole other dimension of uh, uh, that gets added to the state of stress that is difficult to, to see how that influences, uh, you know, uh, your ability to maintain mechanically stable interfaces, right? Um, so that's what immediately pops into my head when you start talking about uh, these macroscopic yeah. stresses. Yeah, and I would, you know, I mean, I take maybe some lesson from some of the work that's been done in adding silicon right to lithium ion cells which is you know the the stress is associated with expansion of the silicon and you know so you see some companies now moving from pouch cells to cylindrical cells to to take care of those stresses that are being generated so you know anytime we start moving in a new direction in terms of cell configuration cell structure we there will be unexpected um I would say challenges. So as we start building up these multi-layer cells, I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna have to address some of these things as well. So it's probably a bit early for us to project what that's gonna look like, but I'm sure that you know I can tell you in the early days of even building out these uh, uh, water stable electrodes where we were cycle, we we're actually making rechargeable lithium air cells at that time. And uh, you can imagine you've got a volume change in the lithium electrode, pretty substantial. You got a volume change in the air electrode because this is a rather unique structure. And all of those things have to be in intimate electrochemical contact to, to survive. And uh, we were, so we in fact were able to engineer a solution to that particular uh, technology where we had these, I would call them kind of pseudo springs, you know, these kind of uh, silicone type springs that would actually maintain kind of a relatively constant pressure among components. And, you know, part of that kind of engineering is going to be necessary here too, because we have we have a lot of volume change in the, in the, the negative electrode, right, in these glass structures. So there, there there's absolutely some engineering challenges. It's a little bit difficult to say exactly what that's going to do. I would say, I mean, relative to cost in, so for almost any new technology in the early days of introduction, it'll be a high priced technology, right? It wouldn't matter. Lithium ion, I think in the early days was, eight dollars a watt hour something like that right now it's you know i've seen far far below that um so that that's going to be almost certainly the case with any of these new chemistries is you know as you introduce them to the market you you're going to introduce them in premium markets that can afford to pay a price for this you know boon in energy density and specific energy and then as you know as that engineering and manufacturing uh matures you know you start to you know, you start to find ways to do it in a kind of a, a you know, a more elegant kind of cost-effective way. So there'll be a learning curve here for sure. Steve, absolutely agreed. Um, you know, maybe continue along this theme of manufacturing, especially high volume manufacturing. Yeah. So Steve, maybe I can offer a, maybe a provocative um, point. Um, you know, in the talk today, we compared um, a lot to, you know, solar cells and displays and so forth, right. couldn't help to recognize that, you know, current density for batteries are generally pretty low, right? Um, you know, they're milliamp per square centimeter. That's right. That's right. If you compare this to solar cell, it's, it's you know, it's quite a bit lower. Um, if I look at my computer, you know, I probably need about 10 to 20 times the area of my display for my battery, right? So, you know, you know, my, my whatever, um, you know, six by six inch display, Right. I'm guessing I need 20 or 30 layers of that to make a battery to support the computer. So that means, you know, even the cost comparison may not be fully valid because you have to make a lot more uh, or you have to make it a lot faster. Right. And I, right. I, I think this presents an opportunity, but also a, a really big challenge. And I'm, I'm trying to understand sort of, you know, you know, our audiences also spans um, the manufacturing industry as well. Sure. And I'm sure they're thinking about, you know, how do I get there? We can't just make it like Gorilla Glass. It has to be probably 10 times the speed and, you know, whatever, the 10 times less the cost. So yes. I want to sort of explore how big that gap is going for and on a higher level. And Eric, also from your, your industry experience as well, is, you know, how 
much more do we need to reach this gap, to bridge this gap? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we always think is, you know, several years away. Um, I think we've been saying and hearing that for decades. Several years. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. Yeah, so decades. sorry for the provocative question, but I wanted to just, you know, maybe focus on this comparison to solar cells and, and display a little bit more um, to, to sort of see what more we need to do. Yeah, well, that's a tough question, <laughs> clearly. Um, again, I would I would go back um, and look a bit at the history of the introduction of, of lithium ion, right? 1991, Sony um, introduces this technology to the world. And back, you know, at that time, I don't think those cells did more than a couple of hundred cycles, right? Um, but nevertheless, um, you had you had a battery um, that was being charged, you know, at basically close to the instability of the electrolyte, um, which you know obviously was a safety concern. And and Sony had, as you probably know, but they had a bunch of electronic controls on each cell, right, to to turn the cell off if you got into trouble. And all of that, I can I certainly remember when it was introduced. Most of the American manufacturers, I mean, battery manufacturers said, ah, this is just, you know, nothing, right? It's not, a, it's not possible. You, you can't do that. It's not going to be economically, uh, it's never going to scale. And so, um, yeah, obviously that mapped out quite differently, right? They, they were, you know, so these batteries were introduced in the three C's, you know, cell phones, camcorders, uh, and, you know, uh, and computers, right? So, at, a, at again, a pretty high price point. And then I think even at that time when American manufacturers looked at what was necessary in terms of the tolerances of, you know, the, the cathode and anode coding processes and just, you know, the, just teetering on the edge of instability, which sound, and there were fires, as everybody knows, there, there were actually laptops that got on fire. There was a bunch, there were certainly a bunch of things that had to happen, I you know, and, and in fact, there was, a, you know, this energy density improvement, right? The fact that these batteries were lighter um, and smaller, you know, that compelled, you know, the, the industry, right, to make rapid advances in manufacturing and chemistry. And this, you know, I, shortly after the introduction into the, say, the three Cs, at presentations, largely by Japanese companies, the next, you know, the, one of the questions was, well, you know, are these batteries ever going to see application in power tools? And I honestly got people laughed, right? <laughs> it's just no way. That's crazy. You know, you're just going to have exploding power tools. And, you know, that's irresponsible to even suggest that lithium ion could end up in a power tool. And well, a couple of years later, they're in power tools. And then the next question was, you know, can they ever possibly see application in electric vehicles? And if you look at the early days when DOE was, you know, funding some of the work in the US and putting up cost targets, everybody thought that the, these DOE cost targets were crazy and could never be met, you know, both from a raw materials and, and, and lo and behold, we're there, right? Uh, and, and it continues to drop these costs. Can, so, uh, you know, the market, you know, if the market's there, and it is, right, it, it's remarkable um, that will drive its own type of innovation, which is a bit unpredictable. Uh, you know, as and I can remember back when LIPF6 was a you know pretty expensive salt for lithium ion. It was co controlled largely by Japanese manufacturers, and lo and behold, you know, a company in China, uh, you know, d basically engineers a solution that gets them at like half the price for LIPF6. No one saw that coming. Now they control that market. So I are there are going to be parts of this process that are difficult to predict, but I I think given the opportunities and the size of the market for advanced batteries, you know, I do think that that will drive innovation in ways that are a little bit difficult to predict. So, in you know, in our, you know, of course, we'll be focused on certain parts of the technology that to get it into the market, um, but it's almost certain that there'll be other, once that's done, there'll be other players that will do rather ingenious things that are kind of difficult to predict, right? That will, that will kind of lead the way. Now, there are, you know, clearly paths that you can't go down um, where you can just see that this is going to be too expensive right you know from from kind of the get-go and i i mean even when you look at things like life like the lipon batteries it's not like people didn't so that's a very interesting technology i mean it cycles well it's completely solid state um there were some pretty serious attempts to scale that technology right um to to actually take it into things like cell phones and Apple was one of those contributors, right? They bought one of the 
uh, Lipon type uh, companies, I think it was IPS, Infinite Power Solutions, they were absorbed into the Apple, uh, you know, a sphere. And they, I think they did some, you know, of course, they're quite tight lipped about it, but they did some really innovative work there. Um, and in fact, I was told by one of the, the kind of prime, uh, one of the key scientists there that they could actually power a, an iPhone with this type of a battery. And uh, which I found, you know, surprising because that requires some very innovative work on the cathode, right? To be able to have a composite cathode, because normally those are, you know, just single material sputtered LCO type cathodes. Uh, In any case, they claimed that they had it. And I I asked them, well, okay, so when do we see it in an iPhone? And they said, well, there's a problem. And I said, well, you know, I can guess what that problem is, but how big? And they said, well, that's about a thousand times more expensive than than a lithium ion battery. So not everything can, you know, is going to transition that way, right? There are some approaches that I think you can say right from the get-go are going to be far too expensive downstream to ever uh, you know, see introduction into large co- commercial, you know, applications. But uh, I think on the glass side, um, certainly we can look to other industries to take advantage of the way glass is manufactured. Um, but that doesn't mean there won't be hurdles. There will be, right? Um, we know we're certainly not there yet. I absolutely share your optimism, Stephen. I think you're absolutely right that the, the glasses are a lot closer yeah, uh, right, than others. Right. And it's a great starting point. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Eric, how about scientific gaps um, that what we still need to cross? So I, from my standpoint, it's really just, uh, you know, filling these uh, knowledge gaps in relation to uh, the mechanical properties as a functional length scale, right? So how do you engineer the materials to optimize their stress relaxation capabilities? So either alloying the lithium or orienting the lithium so it has some uh, preferential texture relative to the, the interface um, or doing some clever tricks with the, um, the electrolyte, right? That's what seems to me to be the um, um, the important element from um, um, materials engineering side, I guess, right? But I can only speak to that. I really don't even know how that stacks up in relation to the electrochemical issues that um, you know also have to be met, right? right. right. So uh, it's just one little piece of the puzzle. If I can build on that, Eric, um, you know, one thing I think it's really exciting, I think I alluded to this early and and, and you emphasize this is, um, this is the mechanical property of a highly reactive system. Uh, Actually, you know, can you maybe give us a sense of, is is there another reactive system in which the mechanical property is so critical? None that I'm aware of, no. I think this is really the frontier question that makes it so special scientifically. Right. Uh, I mean, it's one of the most reactive metal. Uh, and uh, sorry, it is the most reactive metal. Um, may, maybe sodium is a little bit more reactive, but um, it's. I, I think to me, that's the scientific. Scientifically, it's really rich. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, undoubtedly, yeah. And even you know, take away the reactivity element of it, and it's just a matter of trying to understand the the fundamentals of plasticity at small length scales in a material at a high homologous temperature, right? And we really don't do that very often either, right? I mean, all of our you know, nuclear materials are probably the closest you come to that, but it's always about bulk properties, typically, certainly not always. Right. Um, and from a scientific standpoint, trying to explore those uh, um, stress relaxation mechanisms in those materials is a lot harder because you gotta be at temperatures that are, you know, 800 degrees C and, and above, right? So, and by the way, they are super inert, right? So, uh, well, sure, right, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so we're high homologous temperature, super reactive. So, yes, yeah, right. That combination is unparalleled in lithium. Yeah, and uh, to add to something, I think you said earlier, Eric, about you know the contamination of the surface of the lithium. Most people's experience with with lithium, if you're buying it from any of these commercial suppliers, is pretty. Certainly, the surfaces are quite dirty, right? I mean, they're they're actually intentionally contaminated, right? So most most producers of lithium foils um, will extrude and possibly calendar the lithium and then intentionally expose it to CO2 because they want to give it a surface that's reproducible, right? But it's 
but it's always contaminated. And so, you know, there, there are quite a few, I would say, studies where people are trying to join lithium with a solid electrolyte. That's not so trivial, unless you're evaporating. I and mean, evaporation is kind of a clear path. But to make a connection between commercial lithium foils and solid electrolytes, pretty damn tough because of this contamination, which is, you know, either unintentional or intentional, but always there. Yeah, well, it certainly isn't a good thing from a mechanic standpoint. <laughs> right, right. Yep, yep. That's yep. So Eric and Steve, uh, you know, thank you so much for sharing all the deep insights. I, I thought I could end this session uh, with a, a short question to the both of you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in looking at your careers, I couldn't help to notice you are ex you're both extremely interdisciplinary. Steve, I think you mentioned uh, yeah. you came from the solid oxide fuel cell world, and, and yes. there are a lot of commonalities. And you know, yeah. we have a lot of students and young scientists and engineers in the audience. I was hoping that maybe you can comment on sort of your career path and how you were able to bring different fields together in a synergistic manner uh, to solve problems, uh, say here for for energy storage and the energy transition. Yeah, I mean, certainly, actually, so the the fact, you know, my work in solid oxide fuels was kind of interesting because, and it did, it did inform quite a bit of the work we do in solid state batteries. Um, it was partly motivated by the fact that uh, Polypus is one of the first companies that was spun out of the Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. I think we were number two. We're certainly the only company that still exists from that, <laughs> that, that era. Um at that time, it was a relatively new process for the national labs and universities, right? And um, there was a there was a a, a lot of concern re uh, regarding conflict of interest. Um, so when we spun the company out, I retained my position at the lab, so I was basically running both, which was a bit chaotic. But in any case, I was told in no uncertain terms that I could no longer do battery research at the lab because it was too close to uh, to what we were doing offsite, and that would so this would be a conflict of interest. So I said, well, you know, batteries is kind of what I know. So what do I do next? And I said, oh, fuel cells. So we we actually embarked on a uh, and developed a program. And in fact, uh, at, we we at, I think within uh, a few years had the highest power density SOFC on the planet, and it was using kind of similar techniques to what I described today, where we we actually supported thin zirconia membranes on uh, composite structures and co-fire them and densified them into pinhole-free structures. So we had, yeah, we had two, two uh, micron to five micron thick uh, zirconia. And, you know, that allowed us to run. Of course, the current densities there are a lot different than battery current densities, right? They're, they're amps per square centimeter, not, not milliamps, right? So it's, it's a quite a different domain. But in any case, um, it certainly informed a, a lot of the work that we're doing now at Polyplus. And, and, you know, it, it's a, it's not a bad, path. you know, all these electric chemical systems share some commonalities, um, even though there may be orders of magnitude differences in terms of the, the, the currents you're running and, and different temperature regimes. But I, I, I certainly would recommend uh, a multidisciplinary approach to, to anybody working in this field, because there's so many materials at play here. There are so many um, different interfaces that we have to accommodate um, that, you know, th there's no doubt that having, um, I would say, a, a kind of multidisciplinary background is is going to help, I think, uh, people be a bit more adventurous in, in their thinking. And I've got a couple of dogs that just join me. By. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess you can always thank uh, compliance requirements at National Labs as the origin of innovation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's absolutely right. Eric, your thoughts. So, uh, yeah, I, a lot of what uh, Steve said, I would say the same thing. Uh, I think the um, um, the collaborations, right? That that's the really the only key piece of the puzzle. I, without that, I never would have gotten anywhere in the battery materials. Um, in fact, I I still remember the the very first day I ever saw any data come back from lithium in the nano indentation experiment. And uh, I just sort of, you know, looked at the computer screen and was like, yeah, I don't want anything to do with that. That's messy. And <laughs> I was ready to go. Um, and I, where I had come from, you know, I was doing a lot of work with the microelectronics industry at the time. And we were doing a lot of work on uh, locate dielectrics and uh, their thin films 
boy, you could do just, you know, 10 experiments and you'd have 10 load displacement curves that were right on top of one another, right? It was just remarkably reproducible. And lithium is the other end of the spectrum <laughs> at these length scales. And so, uh, yeah, I really didn't want to get involved with it. Um, and, uh, but Nancy Dudney kind of sucked me in. And then um, uh, a colleague here at Michigan Tech, a fellow named Steve Hackney, um, he had some really good ideas. And, you know, instead of running 25 indents per sample, we started running, you know, 100, 200. And then it was, okay, maybe we can start to do something, you know, from a statistical standpoint and figure some of this out. But uh, it was, um, like you said, it's just an extremely rich material from a scientific standpoint, but wow, is it difficult to work with. The experiments are hard, the data analysis is hard. Um, and so if I hadn't had people to work with like Nancy and Steve Hackney and Steve Visco and other folks, I, I definitely would have given up. Um, <laughs> so it's just been um, really rewarding. You know, at the beginning of my talk, I said, uh, you know, without these collaborators helping me out, I wouldn't be here today. I, I literally meant that. Um, you got to have that uh, cross-disciplinary help um, and, uh, you know, people that are just excited to explore that space and try to figure it out, you know? Um, so yeah, that's what comes to mind for me. Well, I really resonate with the message here. Um, you know, be adventurous and try new things and work with yeah. new people. Um, you know, I, and, uh, you know, I really resonate with that. Well, uh, on, uh, on behalf of Stanford, we really appreciate the time and Steve, especially for your early hours here with us, really appreciate it. Yeah. And thanks for all of your contributions to the field. Um, if I can have the closing slides, please. I believe we have uh, aqueous energy storage um, on our schedule. And then two weeks after that, uh, we will have one on sodium ion batteries. And forgive me, I may have flipped the two. So these are both tackling the issues of low cost uh, energy storage uh, for decarbonizing the grid. So please join us uh, for those two events before we come to the end of the year. And again, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Eric, for the thank time you spent well. with us this morning. Yeah. Really enjoyed it. And uh, good luck in tackling these super reactive high homologous temperature uh, system. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very All much. Right, you too. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.